Hello everyone and welcome back to the next part of my job series videos. Today, I felt that with the latest release of the Blue Mage job, now was a good time to go into details about the ever famous Blue Mage. We're going to start things off by going back in history and look more into the progression of the Blue Mage job from some of the other games. Now, Blue Mage first made its appearance in Final Fantasy V, and you are free to shift into that job whenever you want to once you obtain it. While it's not as old as the White or Black Mages, it's still considered to be a classic job for the series. Blue Mages, as their name imply, are a special type of magic user who focuses on blue magic, and blue magic is a type of magic that allows the user to use attacks that would normally be exclusive to enemies and monsters. They're often seen wearing blue robes and cloaks, oftentimes with a mask, and more commonly use staffs or rods as their choice of weapon. They're usually seen wearing blue robes and cloaks, sometimes even with a mask, and they commonly use staffs or rods as their weapons of choice. For a blue mage, most of the time the only way they can learn a spell is if a monster uses a specific spell on them in battle, and usually in that case they actually have to be hit with the attack before it sinks in. Learning through experience, I guess. So, for example, if you have a blue mage going up against a monster that uses aqua breath, after they use the attack on you, you're able to learn it afterwards. Any game that has a blue mage in them usually will have a list of spells that they can learn, and the spells do vary depending on the game. I have a list of the most common or well-known spells that blue mages are seen using, so if you are a fan of the blue mages, then I'm sure that you must have heard at least of some of these spells, though their effects do vary depending on what you're playing. We have Mighty Guard, which is usually a defensive move that increases one's defense, White Wind, which is a healing spell that restores HP, Aqua Breath is an attacking spell of water elemental damage to all enemies, Bad Breath is a debuffing spell that can inflict all manner of illnesses on your enemies, and you can usually learn it from fighting Marlboro enemies. Flamethrow inflicts fire elemental damage to one or more enemies, and they're generally learned from dragons. Doom can inflict the spell of doom on one enemy for an automatic KO. 1000 Needles is almost always learned from the Cactars, and they can inflict 1000 points of damage to an enemy regardless of their defense status or bonuses. And Self Destruct, which allows you to sacrifice yourself to inflict heavy damage to an enemy, and those are generally learned from the bomb enemies. And as you can see from this short list alone, the blue mage generally have a wide range of powers and abilities. While the white mages focuses more on healing and defense, black mages focus more on offensive attacks, and then there's the red mage that focuses on a series of more well-rounded spells and attacking. The blue mage is more of whatever the situation calls for spells. Usually, they are the ones that are focusing on buffing and debuffing while having a little bit of everything else. But their spells do tend to range from healing, to buffing, to debuffing, to offensive or defensive attacks. While they are not as strong as some of the other mage classes when it comes to attacking or defending, they are usually seen as pretty capable fighters, and perhaps they have the most variety when it comes to magical abilities. There are many different other spells out there, but the ones on this list are just the most common and they do give you the basic idea of just what blue magic is capable of doing. Now as I said before, the blue mage was first introduced way back in Final Fantasy V, which happened to be one of the jobs that you earn from the Wind Crystal near the beginning of the game. After you unlock it, all the party members are able to become a blue mage and they are able to learn a host of different abilities whenever they're struck by it in battle. In this game, there are a total of 30 different spells that the blue mage can learn, and the best part is that once one of your blue mages learns the ability, then they all learn it. So you don't have to have them all stuck as a blue mage for them to get the ability. Now we do see plenty of traces of blue magic after this game as well, though it's going to be a while before we actually see another blue mage again. In Final Fantasy VI, blue magic is instead called lures, and you can learn enemy magic by simply witnessing it in battle. So you don't need to be hit with it in the attack. However, if you are afflicted with certain debuffs such as blind, petrify, sleep, etc., then they don't count. So it can be pretty tricky to have your characters learn these useful spells. In Final Fantasy VII, it's a little bit more complicated because here you have the enemy skill material that works a lot like blue magic. 
This is a special type of material that you can equip to your teammates and you can learn different enemy skills when they are hit while wearing it. The entire idea of materia can be confusing in and of itself, but basically there are different enemy skill material that you can find throughout the world of Final Fantasy VII and you can give them to your party members which they can use to learn different abilities when they're hit with a suitable power. However, I think that the first official blue mage of the series would probably be considered Quintus Trip from Final Fantasy VIII. Now, Quintus in the game is a child prodigy in Final Fantasy VIII. She became a seed member when she was only 15, and she was also the youngest instructor in Bablem Garden when she was only 18. However, because she's less strict than the other instructors, a lot of students don't tend to take her very seriously. She is usually seen as the calm, stoic, and generally composed person, and she sort of takes on the role of the group's big sister, and takes it upon herself to look after the others, especially with Squall. As for how she fights in the game, her chosen weapon is a whip, and like with most blue magic, she has to learn her magic from the enemy, although she does start off with a move known as Laser Eye. She doesn't have the official Blue Mage title, however she does have the limit break called Blue Magic, which helps her to learn the spells from various items from enemies. She has a total of 16 different Blue Magic spells she can learn, and their effects are subject to change based on her current crisis level in battle. So in other words, the greater her crisis level in battle, the greater the effects from her spells will work. The next Blue Mage that we know of would probably be considered Quina from Final Fantasy IX. Quina is interesting to say the least. He or she is known as a Q who loves eating frogs. And to be honest, we never really get it confirmed for us if Quina is a he or a she, but in this case, I'm just going to refer to her as a she. Anyway, she has a childlike view of the world and is always up for exploring new locations so she can find new tastes and try it out. She's someone who takes whatever life has to throw at her, but always bounces right back up and keeps going. So her reasons for traveling alongside the rest of our party members may not be considered as important or as big. She is still someone who learns to care for her friends, such as when she's seen comforting Vivi and Freya, and she even helps Echo learn how to cook. But she's a pretty powerful opponent in combat. In fact, the way that she learns her spells and abilities is through eating the local wildlife. She uses forks in battle and can deal random bits of damage, which can be powerful. However, for her to learn new abilities, the rest of the party has to weaken down certain enemies to at least 25% of their HP before she's able to use a move called Eat, which then lets her swallow them whole and learn their abilities. Quina is strange alright, but I know that Final Fantasy IX would not have been the same without her. Now, this next blue mage character is actually literally blue. We have Kamari Ronso from Final Fantasy X. Now, Kamari is a creature known as a Ronso, a strong, horned, cat-like creature from Spira. Now, in his youth, Kamari faced against a couple of his own tribesmen in battle, but refused to admit defeat even though he knew he stood little chance of victory. Eventually, he pushed so hard that his horn was broken off in the battle, and to the Ronso, a broken horn is a sign of disgrace. This here is seen as the greatest shame that a Ronso can bring upon themselves, and so unable to carry around this shame, he chose to leave his tribe and was content to wander the wilds for a time. Kamari is one of those strong, silent type. He is rarely seen speaking to anyone. In fact, for most of the beginning of the game, and well on into the middle of it, we don't even hear him speak once, but this is due to the fact that he only talks to those he likes and trusts. And the few times he does speak, it's really with helpful and sage-like advice. Despite his otherwise terrifying appearance, he is surprisingly kind-hearted and is fiercely protective of his comrades, especially to Yuna, whom he has protected and looked after since she was a little girl. He journeys with us to help rid Spear of sin, but also he hopes to eventually be able to reclaim his honor from his people, and he really does achieve that at the end of the game. Kamari uses a lance in battle, just like a dragoon does, and he even has the jump ability. He starts off with higher strength, defense, and magic compared to the rest of our party. However, what makes him different is that he has the ability of a lancet, and this is the key to him learning new abilities. The Sphere Grid, where he learns his abilities, is much more open than the others, and so he is able to learn most of the same spells that the others can. 
so you can say that that makes him a blue mage alone because of this fact. However, it's really his overdrive that really shows off the power of blue magic. His overdrive is known as Ronso Rage, and this lets him cast a variety of powerful enemy spells, though he needs the spell of Lancet to learn them. In other words, even if he kills an enemy in battle, and he can learn to copy their power later on, unless he uses the power of Lancet on it, he's not going to be able to learn it. So whenever he's up against an opponent in battle, it's always good to have him use Lancet right away, just to see if they have any hidden powers that he can take. In Final Fantasy X-2, Yuna and the other Gullwings have the Gun Mage Dress Sphere, which is another Blue Mage type. Now this is much more of what you would expect from the classic Blue Mage job, despite the fact that they use bullets and guns instead of wands or staffs. When they are equipped with this Dress Sphere, any one of these three are able to learn certain skills by surviving certain attacks, and then can turn around and use them against our opponents by using the Blue Bullet command. However, be warned that each party member has to learn these attacks individually. Unlike Final Fantasy V, where you need just one blue mage to learn the spells for all of them, all three of these have to learn their own spells on their own. Moving on to Final Fantasy XI, we have the official blue mage, which is pretty interesting to say the least. Here, the blue mage job is seen using a pair of twin blades, and there are over 150 different spells that the blue mage can learn, and so it can be a bit of a long grind. It's a bit more complicated to master this job compared to other games because the spells are based on the caster's own skill rather than the different spells themselves. To become a blue mage, you first need to seek out a mysterious fortune teller named Wild, who you can find in the gladiator's alley. It's here he sees a lot of potential in you and he starts to ask you a series of questions regarding morality and the idea of gaining power. If you give him the right answers, he will then tell you to fetch an item to heal his bedridden mother. It's after that that we meet a man named Yasfel, who reveals to you that the quest that you were just sent on was just a test, and that he's impressed by what he saw. So he makes you an offer to become a blue mage. Now if you refuse, you can simply walk away. However, if you accept, he will then knock you out, and when you next wake up, Yasfel will be introducing himself with his real name as Rao Bon. In fact, it's because of him that a lot of people theorized in Final Fantasy XIV that the Flame General is actually a blue mage and we can learn blue magic from him. Now it's a nice tie-in. Raubon in Eleven is a blue mage who happens to be the leader of the Immortals and uses a pair of twin blades, while we have Raubon in Fourteen, who is the general of the Immortal Flames and uses a similar pair of blades. So I can see where they would get off with that, but all in all, the Blue Mage is a more advanced job in Final Fantasy XI, and it's a tricky job just to get a hang of. Another instance is where you see the Blue Mage is from Final Fantasy XIII 3, Lightning Returns. Lightning has a special garb which is named Blue Mage, and allows her to use certain spells like Lightning and Wind Slash. And these are some of the more classic spells that a Blue Mage has been able to use in the past. Though this is considered to be Blue Magic, Sadly, Lightning isn't able to learn any monster skills when she's wearing it, though it does allow her to wield peculiar magics of nature and hasten the recovery of her ATB. Now I think that will be all for the history of the Blue Mage for now. We are now going to be moving on into the job that we know in Final Fantasy XIV. Normally, for this next part I would talk about the different and more useful spells for the Blue Mage for this game. However, I am working on another video which is going to go into much more details about the 49 different spells that you can learn. I'm going to be talking about their effects and where to obtain them, and that video should be hopefully coming out in a couple days. So instead, we're going to go straight on into 14 itself and the Blue Mage job which was released January 15th, a week after 4.5 Part 1. People have been asking about it for a long time, and most were swearing that it was going to be one of the new jobs for Shadowbringers. But Square Enix ended up surprising us all by revealing that it was going to be coming out in 4.5. However, this job is very different from all other jobs because it is the first of the limited jobs, and since it's the first, it stands to reason that it will probably not be the last. But what is a limited job? Well, to put it simply, this job is going to have many different limitations to how you can use it compared to the others. Compared to the other jobs that came out with Stormblood, for example, the Blue Mage starts off at level 1, and so far its max level is at 50. 
but they did say that this will increase later on. But the biggest difference with this job is that you can't use it to go into duties. So going into duty roulettes, squadron missions, deep dungeons, hall of the novice, stone, sky, sea, or PvP is impossible for the blue mage. Nor can you go into places like Eureka or the Diadem, and don't bother going into those places as other jobs and then trying to switch once you get there because that's not going to work. Also, I'm afraid that you can't play as the Blue Mage through the main scenario questline or teach your retainers to be Blue Mages either. So what is the point for the Blue Mage if you can't go into battles with it? Well, you can still go into dungeons and trials up to level 50 so long as you are part of a fixed party. But that's not the point of the Blue Mage. See, they have this job as a more unique solo gameplay experience which will allow you to learn all the manner of monster actions through Blue Mage specific content. So this is a more in-game content that you can do on your own, actually than rather having a working job that you could adventure with. Another thing that makes a difference are the weapons that you use. The Blue Mage uses canes, and there are only three different types of canes in the game that we have so far. And unlike the other jobs where their weapons enhance their stats, here, the weapons for the Blue Mage don't have any real attributes. So if you want them to have a higher output of magical damage, you need to stack them up on intelligence. So it's important to prepare your gear and accessories with that in mind. They do share their armor and accessories with the other magical range jobs though, like Blue Mage, Red Mage, and Summoner. So if you main as one of those, it should be pretty easy to get hold of some really good gear for them. Now, if you want to unlock the Blue Mage, you first need to complete the quest called out of the blue, which you can get from the Zealous Yellow Jacket in Limsa just beside the Aetherite Crystal. To accept that quest though, you first need to be a level 50 in one of your other jobs and have cleared the main scenario questline up to the ultimate weapon before you can accept the quest. After unlocking it, you are introduced to your teacher Martin and his Mamuja assistants. Martin will then give you some basic level 1 gear and weapons, as well as teach you your first spell of water cannon. You are also given the Blue Mage Spellbook, which will be an entire list of all 49 spells and even hints to where you can find them. Whenever you do learn one of these spells though, you are able to mark it into your hotbar. Now like I said, there are 49 different spells that you can learn, at least for now, and you can have up to 24 of them active at any time. While most jobs let you learn new abilities as you level up, here, you have to go out and learn the abilities from all over Eorzea. So first you have to hunt down the right monster, then witness them using the attack in battle, and once it's defeated you have a chance of learning it. So perhaps you get lucky and get it after one try, or sometimes you have to kill the same monster a bunch of times before you can get it. You should know though that you don't need to be hit by the spell to learn it. You only need to see it cast. Also, if you're dead when the enemy is defeated, you can't learn it either. And if one person in a party learns the spell, then all the other blue mages who are still alive will also learn it. And for some abilities, if you want to learn them, then you have to go into a certain trial or dungeon. But so long as you are part of a fixed party, you can go in unsync, so it should be much easier to actually earn the spell. For some spells though, such as Mighty Guard and White Wind, you can only learn them from the Wallachy Totems. Now these are totems that are supposedly hold the power of the monsters inside them, and they already give you these powers. To obtain these totems though, you need to complete certain achievements. So you either have to learn a certain number of spells, or participate in enough stages of the Mass Carnival before you're able to learn them. Once you have these requirements, you can then speak to Gahi Ja in Udal, who would be happy to give you some. And once you complete the quest for the Blue Mage, you will be welcome to join the Mass Carnival, which is a series of events exclusively for Blue Mages. The Mass Carnival offers you a range of opponents where you can test your skills and earn rewards. Think of it as like a deep dungeon only for Blue Mages. You're in the middle of a platform where different monsters have different strengths and weaknesses and mechanics that you have to remember, and you can test out all of your abilities on them. There are 25 different stages at all, and each one will grow more powerful with each stage that you go through. Though if you want to complete the final Blue Mage quest, you do have to beat stage 25 at the very least. The good thing here though is that you don't need to go through stages 1 through 24 to get to the final one. You can jump in right away once you unlock the Mass Carnival. Now as for the quests themselves for the storyline, 
The story begins in Limsa, where we help a zealous yellow jacket hunt down a man who is rumored to be scamming people by helping them to become blue mages. After meeting with him and his assistants, we find that while he wasn't lying about how to become a blue mage, he was acting irresponsible in not warning people the dangers of blue magic first, and he's then forbidden to sell any more wares. That is where we are introduced to a woman named Royce, who runs the Mass Carnival and is on the lookout for new entertainment for the masses, and this idea of blue magic has caught her attention. So she offers Martin a job as the Great Azuro, and he is now in the pits battling against all manner of creatures. But it seems that Royce is also interested in your training and wants to see you in the arena as well. So Martin takes up the role of mentor and finds time to teach you blue magic on the side, though they mostly involve you going out and killing a few random monsters while he is obsessed with earning money, but there's a reason for this. During these quests though, he will ask that you have to learn certain spells before you can move on. So not only do you have to be at the right level, you also need to have learned these certain spells before you can continue on. For the level 10 quest, you will be asked to learn Blood Drain. For the level 20 quest, you will need Phase. For level 30, it's Mind Blast. Level 40 is 1000 Needles. And level 50 is Glower. Now, at first we get the impression that Martin only cares about making money, but we soon find out that it's vanishing pretty quickly. We found out the reason for this is because he's spending all of his money on buying dream flowers on the black market to make medicine. You see, he learned the art of blue magic from a tribe called the Wallachie back in the New World, and he even lived with them for a while so that he could learn it. But now the whole tribe has fallen ill because of an epidemic that spread from Eorzea, and he wants to do what he can to help them. So he has faced financial ruin and bodily harm to get the main ingredient to make the medicine to cure his friends. After understanding this, Royce allows him to continue working for the Mass Carnival and even offers to help him find another source of dream flowers. To thank her, he starts performing more often at the Mass Carnival, but eventually he's pushed himself so hard that he was injured by one of the monsters. That is where we are properly introduced to Weistrot, a man who actually studied blue magic with Martin with the Wallachy and he even offers to become our mentor until Martin heals. Now these two were actually once part of the Arcanist Guild, and they went to the New World together to study blue magic. However, blue magic was rejected by the Guild, and they went separate ways. When Martin returning to the New World so that he can learn more about blue magic, and Weistrop becoming a businessman to sell Ceruleum, and so the two have very different ideals. Yet out of the two of them, even Martin admits that he's no real match for Weistrot, who may be considered the most powerful blue mage in all of Eorzea. Still, we agree to take a training session with him because Martin is unable to. And during this lesson, that's where we get a more insight into Weistrot's way of thinking. He's someone who believes that the world is changing and soon the time of magics and swords is going to be over, as we look more to magic tech and machines. Still, he's clearly impressed by how far we've come, and even offers us a position in his company should we be interested in catching up with the rest of the world, or so he claims. Regardless of how he feels, though, he does want to help the Wallachie with their sickness, and so, for the sake of helping their old teachers, these two bury the hatchet for the greater good and agree to work together to produce and deliver the medicine. Once you reach the level 50 quest and learn all the spells that Martin wants you to learn, he admits that you've come a long way and are becoming a fine blue mage. Surely you're almost ready to enter the mass carnival with him. At least until things go from good to bad very quickly. We meet a boy named Sita who happens to be one of the Wallachie's Kairujans and he's been helping Martin with discovering the medicine needed for his village. He comes to tell Martin that Weistrot has delivered the medicine and the Wallachie are well on their way to a full recovery, but that's where the good news ends. It turns out that the Wallachie live in a place called Lapis Canyon, where the ground is a bright blue color, and to them it's considered to be sacred land. However, what this place really is, is full of bright blue ceruleum, and Weistrot took advantage of this sickness to try and scam the Wallachie out of their lands so that he could mine the ceruleum. Livid at this treachery, Martin goes to confront Weistrot about this whole deceit. After tracking him down, Weistrot tries to claim that it was all legal and that the Wallachie elders agreed to this by signing a binding contract that will allow him to mine Lapis Canyon. 
Sita has a very different story, however, reminding him that their elders cannot read Eorzean, and that he threatened not to hand over the medicine unless they agreed to sign the papers to begin with, never once mentioning what he was going to do to their sacred grounds. Weistrot doesn't see this as a problem, however, and that the Wallachy need to become part of the modern world, and is more than happy to employ them for the mine. We argue with him that the elders were tricked, and it's not up to Weistrot to decide how others should live their lives. Just when it looks like things are about to end in violence, Royce appears, and we find out that she was actually Weistrot's financial backer this whole time. She wanted to help the Wallachy herself, and she does it the only way she knew how. However, it also turns out that Weistrot went behind her back and decided to open a mine on the Wallachy's lands without telling her. That is when she decides that they should settle this with a battle, and that both Martin and Weistrot should meet as blue mages in the arena in the Mass Carnival to decide the fate of Lapis Canyon. Now, she promises to withdraw her investments should Martin win. However, if he loses, he will be forced to persuade the Wallachy to surrender their lands as per the agreement. Everyone agrees in the end. Only there's one problem. Martin is still recovering from his injuries, so we are selected to take his place as Azuro II. It's here that you are finally allowed to enter the Mass Carnival, as well as given a new outfit to fit the mood, and you are finally ready to fight for what's right. That's when Royce dresses Weistrot as the terrifying Azumaga, who literally looks like a demon. And it's fitting, for he shows that he is a truly powerful blue mage, and defeating him is not going to be easy. Azumaga is going to be waiting upon the final stage of the Mass Carnival, and so you are free to choose. You can go straight to the 25th stage, or you can start off with the first 24 and hone your skills. Either way, you are not able to put an end to this until you face Azumaga on the final stage and defeat him. In the end, you are able to defeat him in front of a roaring crowd and secure the lands for the Wallachy, and earn the title of the strongest blue mage in Eorzea in the process. Everyone is happy for this, even Weistrot, who after playing the part of a villain, realizes that he is a businessman, not a monster. So he parts in good spirits, promising to leave the Wallachy to discover their own future, but he still decides to go back to the New World with Sita and to see if he could find any other lands like Lapis Canyon, only he promises that he won't try to steal anything should they belong to someone else. Martin thanks us again for all that we've done and now decides what he wants to do with his life now that his friends are safe and healthy again. In the end, he decides to open up a guild for blue magic and spread the Wallachy's teachings in Eorzea. To do that though, it means a lot of gil, so he's going to continue on being the great Azoro for the time being. And so even though we must part ways with him, we can see him whenever we want in the Mass Carnival. Right, so that is the quest for the Blue Mage. But that leads to the question of what comes after. Even though this job is a limited job, Square Enix did say that the level will increase in Shadowbringers, and so future patches, we can be certain that there will be more quests involving Martin and the Wallachy. I do think that Weistrot has learned his lesson, and I will be surprised if we see him again, but I would like to hear more about the New World and possibly visit there one day. I do, I can say that I'm pretty confident that we will have some more pages added to our spellbook, which will mean new spells that we can learn and new stages for the Mass Carnival. I think that any future updates to the Blue Mage will be helping Martin in starting his Guild of Blue Magic, maybe even having to open it New Doll at one point. But that's all up to the future for now. Anyway, that's going to be it for now. I hope you all enjoyed learning about the Blue Mage job and that you are eager to try out everything that our newest job has to offer. While it is still a limit to how much fun that we can have on it, I am hopeful that it will be much more open to more ideas later on in future patches, and that they will continue to improve upon it. So, that's it for now. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next week with a brand new video on the next job.